the Tawana region is dying. I said, if someone doesn't do something, this community will be a dead community. I have a paved road from interstate to region. Now what do I do to bring people down 30 miles? Then it dawned on me, nobody's gonna drive 30 miles for normal sculptures, but they might drive for the world's largest. I started the Enchanted Highway in 1989. I've been at it for 28 years, and it takes me roughly about four to five years to do one sculpture. The first year, Local ranchers taught me how to weld. I put in eight hours a day to get one sculpture done. I use old oil well tanks. I cut them open and I flatten it out and that's 90% of my metal. It's a passion project right now. I started with the world's largest tin family. The man is 45 feet tall, the woman is 43 feet, and the boy is 23 feet. Geese in flight has over 300 lengths of oil well pipe on, over 15 miles of weld on it, and is in the Guinness Book of Records the world's largest scrap metal sculpture. That's something I will continue on till I'm six feet under. And then I hope it continues on after that. I want people to see that this guy who didn't know how to weld, didn't have an art class, if he can create something like this, I can do most anything. A lot of people wonder why I'm living here. Because I could live in LA or New York and be building sculptures there, but the minute I drive up to my little ranch here, I feel like I'm onto something that's never been done before. My name is John Lopez, and I'm a scrap metal sculptor. I use a scoop shovel, I use snow chains, I use wrenches, scissors, gosh, I use tractor seats. Basically anything that is mild steel. It just so happens that I live in a scrap metal paradise because every farmer and rancher in the area has a scrap metal pile of some kind. People are very generous around here to invite me over and say, you can look through our scrap pile. And so that's where I gather my materials for my sculptures. So then I bring all this found objects home that I've handpicked and I start grabbing things and fitting them up there. It's a textural experience. It's almost like a patchwork quilt, if you will. It's got a little bit of everything in it. And within all that chaos, when you step back, the animal comes to life. And scrap metal shouldn't do that. One of the most important things for me is to be connected to the land. South Dakota inspires me. I bought an empty lot on Main Street in Lemon. And right next to the park that I put it in, was an old bar called the Kokomo. I cleaned the Kokomo out, renovated it, and turned it into a really nice art gallery where I can feature and show my finished sculptures. I've had people come up to me and express in emotion what it means to them, or I've had letters. I've seen a lot of scrap metal sculptures around, but I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody capture the life that my sculptures capture. And maybe it will affect some of the kids that live here in their life and send them off in a direction that it wouldn't if I wasn't living here.
A lot of the work is quite repetitive. The pleats took about two months to do. Probably did those eyes 10 times. Even the texture of the skin, their graceful dancing, which I wanted to portray. That's the whole goal is to make them feel like they're gonna swim away. I'm Steven Kessler, also known as Tusk. I'm a large-scale wildlife sculptor. I found sculpture a little later in life, in my late 30s. Moving from one career to the other, especially into the art world, that's totally scary and foolish thing to do. I don't think I had an option after I started sculpting. I think my life was going to be it no matter what I did. Sculpture as a whole has inspired me. I mean, it's a 24 hour thing for me. Sleep just gets in the way, almost. When I'm out doing day-to-day -day things, not being here, it's always running through my head. I don't know if I'd personally call myself a daydreamer, but I could probably be labeled one. There is definitely a calming with clay. I usually work 12 hours for three days straight. Being able to realize what I want in it quickly, it just seems like it works together with how I process. I've been involved with making three life-size giraffes, 40-foot whale shark, four manta rays, and we're working on this 30-foot iguana behind me. The humpback whales took roughly nine months. The inspiration to do these pieces for the aquarium was because Utah is a landlocked state. There's a limited number of people that you see these in real life anyways. To be able to be in the same room, feel the size of it, hopefully there's an energy to it and hopefully inspire conservation acts because of it. If someone says, oh, I can't sculpt this, have you tried? Buy it, you know, you never know what's gonna happen. Open the box of clay, see what's in it, you know, there might be a humpback whale in the future. A nest is a place where you have a sense of protection and strength. It's like an earth temple or a nature temple. The wood is following a pattern, but not one branch is the same. As a nest builder, I'm following those patterns. Most of the work is trying to bring out the best of those shapes with each other. I'm Jason Fan, and I'm a nest builder. I started building nests as a child. The nest building was really an intuitive process of just gathering branches and, and building forts originally, and the nest grew and got bigger and more elaborate. Now some of the nests are as big as 100,000 pounds of wood. The hardest part of building the nest is really gathering all of the wood. I use a chainsaw to cut wood. I use a machete to cut off all the excess leaves. And from there, I really assess, you know, what kind of shapes I have, what kind of material I have to work with. The construction process of the nest first is creating the foundation and the infrastructure. And then I follow those larger sculptural shapes that I bolt together with smaller material that I can weave in and around. I use every part of the tree, the, the trunk of the tree, all the way down to the very smallest twig and branch of the tree. I've gotten to where I'm used to building them on flatbed trailers and moving them around, and in many cases, I'm transporting them across the country. Because the nests are quite heavy, I use cranes and forklifts and different kinds of equipment. This is all eucalyptus. There's, there's over 75 different species of eucalyptus on this property. I've built around 50 nests all over the country, and now primarily I build the nests with kids within an educational setting. 
As an educator, like it's really important to work with kids and help them realize that they have the ability to shape and create an environment. I'm going to show you how we can integrate those branches into the spiral. I love getting kids out into nature, interacting with nature, and, and the nest is actually very much a collaboration with nature. I know I've done a good job when it looks like the nest is something that could almost have grown out of the ground. 